If you were to go up to someone who has never played Persona before and tell them these two games are from the same series, I'm not sure how many people would believe you. Those who do believe you would probably be impressed by the drastic change in how well the series has modernized itself. But how exactly did we get here? How did we get from point A to point B? Well, to briefly recap, Persona 1 was a game oozing with personality and style while also theming itself around Jungian psychology. For what it's worth, it accurately portrays that theme and features some very good imagery. Persona 2 Innocent Sin began focusing more on the character's personal struggles, and the struggles of youth. And Persona 2 Eternal Punishment tackled the hardships of adulthood. Where do you go from there? What is the next logical step in this series? Well, I guess the only thing that can really top that is... life as a whole. But how do you address life as a whole? Life is a pretty big thing. A human lives up to around, what, 80 years? Yeah, nah, this ain't the board game life. We're not talking about The Sims here. Let's scale it down to about... I don't know... one school year? That, more or less, is the foundation of Persona 3. So imagine you're Atlas, and you're on the verge of bankruptcy. Your first guess on what their next move would be probably wasn't to make another Persona game, since the last entry was... Never mind, not actually bad, it just didn't sell as well as the other games. It's a damn shame too, I thought Eternal Punishment was the better Persona 2 game. However, this was six years after that game, times have changed. Media has changed, and the Persona series was going to have its own transformation. Persona 3 would be the first in the series to blend day-to-day -day life and social sim aspects with the dungeon-crawling RPG aspects we're more familiar with. This decision would push the series in a whole new direction and... effectively divide a fanbase. Yeah, I'm sure it's no secret, but we'll put a pin in that for now. As for me... I first caught wind of the Persona series when Persona 5 first came out. I was a freshman in college. I saw a little bit of Persona 5's story and gameplay through YouTube videos and thought, wow, this is a lot to take in. So I kinda just forgot about it for a while because I was on that Kingdom Hearts grind at the time. I also didn't own a PS4 at the time either, so I was just playing games on PCSX2. A classmate of mine at the time wanted me to show him how to use PS2 emulation as well. So I showed him. Fast forward a couple months and we're both just kinda chillin' at a friend's dorm. I peep over at his screen and see this. I ask him, hey, what game is this? He replies, Persona 3. Persona 3? I've heard of this series before. Then I went back to what I was doing. Just a passing thought and no more. The year passes. I'm a sophomore. I start to get used to the daily grind, and I'm looking for another PS2 game to legally purchase and dump the file so I can emulate it. Then I remember that Persona game my classmate was playing. He had transferred somewhere else at that point, so I couldn't really ask him more about it. Wherever you are, bro. I salute you. The memory of first playing this game is still clear as day in my head. So for context, my friends and I were taking a storyboard class, and while we had a normal day class at a normally scheduled time, we also had one every two weeks where we would assemble in the evening to basically just watch animations. After our normal daytime classes, we would just kinda chill for a few hours until it was time to go to the evening portion. During one of those waits, I just plopped down my laptop and booted up the game right in front of them. That's right, I subjected other people to this game, and now I'm gonna subject you to it. The way the story introduces itself is such a great hook. You're just arriving at Tatsumi Port Island to move to the dormitories for your new school. 
The game constantly jumps between the rustle and bustle of the city, a girl in her room with what looks to be a gun to her head, and the music playing through the main character's headphones. But then, all of that is suddenly interrupted when the clock strikes midnight. The constant noise is cut to a dead silence. The civilians are all in suspended animation, electronics are all inactive. Nonetheless, you must still reach your destination. Just ignore everything around you, it's all good. Oh, there's the place. A young boy wearing prison wear asks you to sign a contract. I hope that's not speaking for what school's gonna be like. After he ominously disappears, it turns out the girl from earlier is here and almost starts packing the heat after you startled her. Thankfully, another girl stops her, right as the lights and music turn back on. You can sense the girl's relief. They seem to be keeping you under high maintenance too. So this is the kind of place we're living, huh? Well, hear me out, it's for good reason. So, you know how everyone except you and the people at the dorm turned into coffins when everything turned green and spooky? It's because you're special. There's a hidden 25th hour that occurs at midnight. During this hour, only certain people remain conscious, and coincidentally, these people are the only ones who can combat the monsters that prey on people at this time. The shadows. These people hold the power of persona. So after awakening to your power during a shadow attack at your dorm, you are invited by the other dormitory residents to join their team. They're technically registered as an official school club, but this entire residency is actually reserved for people who have the potential. Potential meaning anyone who's capable of staying conscious during the dark hour, which usually means being able to use a persona. You also find out that coincidentally, your school transforms into a strange tower where the shadows lurk, these shadows attack people psychologically rather than killing them. This is the cause of an ongoing epidemic known as apathy syndrome, where the victims, referred to the lost, are essentially left in a vegetative state. Since you have the ability to fight these shadows, hey, you know, maybe we should, maybe we should try to stop that. You're given your premise and you're given your goal. It's a bit long-winded, but more straight to the point than Persona 4 or 5. It's at this point where you're pretty much given free reign, so I think now would be a pretty good time to get into the game's skeleton and structure. If I had to describe Persona 3 in just one word, that word would be... organic. To me, this is clearly reflected in the way this game approaches all of its facets, and how well they blend together. Persona 3 introduces the day-by-day -day calendar system. The game is a hybrid between a life-slash-social sim and a dungeon-crawling turn-based RPG. This new format greatly alters how the story is told here compared to the previous games, as well as the overall gameplay loop as a whole. As a day-to-day -day life simulator, you're not going on a world-trotting adventure like a typical JRPG. The vast majority of this game will be taking place in the same settings and doing a lot of the same things. And the game must work around those limitations. Surprisingly, the limitations here work out conveniently. Sorry to beat a dead horse here, but remember, Atlas basically had one foot inside the grave already. This might have been their solution to their budget restraints. I imagine designing the game so that you'd have an excuse to be in a lot of the same places a lot of the time, would have been in their best interest. When put into that perspective, damn, they really squeezed as much as they could out of their limited resources. That's admirable in my eyes. For now, let's take a look into how they execute the gameplay with these constraints. While this mishmash of genre mechanics might sound a bit strange and like it would feel stilted as hell, the two halves of the game work off each other pretty cleverly to make the whole gameplay loop cohesive. You're given time during the day to do a certain number of activities of your choice. You're given one day activity, one for the evening, and if you have some extra time afterwards, you have the option to either study in your room or turn in early. If you really want to, you even have the option to turn in right away. The choice is entirely yours. Many of the things you're given to do in your free time are pretty typical things you would do in the city. Eat out at a restaurant, pray at the shrine, go to the arcade, get a cup of coffee, sing karaoke. Most of them exist as a means for you to increase your social parameters, academics, charm, and courage. 
The shrine allows you to manipulate things such as the progress of social links, modify money or EXP loadouts, or a party member's condition. All mechanics that I will get into shortly. While these activities in question are mundane in nature, especially how the arcade doesn't even show you going into the arcade or give you a minigame for it, missed opportunity. They always provide some sort of tangible benefit that will help you in your other endeavors. Unlike future Persona games, stat increases are always at a fixed rate, making them much more consistent and easy to keep track of. Now would be a pretty good time to get into what these social parameters do. The main meat of Persona 3 consists of two things. The first one is the social links. Social links, in short, are the bonds you share with certain characters, but measured with a rank, each one represented by a character and tarot arcana. This will be what the majority of your daytime activities will be spent on. Aside from a few exceptions, the player will have to go out of their way to participate in clubs at school or visit certain places in town in order to discover and unlock most of their social links. A couple social links even require you to progress far enough in your existing social links to start them, and a few will require your social parameters to be at a certain level. Something the social links in this game specifically do is put more weight on your choices. What I mean by this is that in most cases, not picking the optimal dialogue choices usually just means not getting enough points to rank up the next time you talk to them. However, there are very specific choices where you can mess up and actually upset your social link. This will put the arcana for that social link in the reverse state. Now, don't panic. Reverse does not mean regressing a rank backwards. It simply means you will not be able to progress with the social link. Reverse is actually referring to the position of the card. An upside down tarot card is referred to as being in the reverse state. Which means bad things will happen in fortune telling. You will need to reconcile with that character to restore your social link. This game got the guts to tell the player they were wrong. I have nothing but respect for that. What kind of friendship would it be if you could just be a dick to your friends and they never expressed any problem with it? It'd be a pretty superficial one. Admittedly, the game can be a little too punishing with the system though. At least, in the PS2 versions of the game. The way it works is that there are three ways to reverse a social link. The first way is by ignoring a social link for about 60 in-game days. This one is usually pretty easily avoidable. However, in regards to the female social links in the PS2 version, it actually becomes more difficult. When you reach a certain rank in a female social link, you will reach the intimate stage with them. You're not given a platonic option, unfortunately. Normally, I wouldn't care too much because Persona romances are pretty surface level anyway, but the game punishes you a lot harder than in future games for getting intimate with multiple girls. If you spend time with one girl social link, the other girl will get jealous and the number of days until the link reverses reduces more rapidly. Normally when a social link reverses through neglect, you can simply go to the shrine to get you back on track. However, in the case of jealous social links, you must talk to them directly and make sure you say the right thing. Otherwise the social link will become broken and you will not be able to fuse personas of that character's arcana at all. Both of these methods will consume time. If a social link is broken, then it will require even more time to reconcile with them. It's very easy to see why this can be frustrating for a lot of players. Unless you're extremely conscious of when each girl's intimate phase starts or focus down one girl at a time, there are too many factors that are just out of your control. The jealousy mechanic would later be removed in the PSP version a few years later, leaving it just down to the other two ways to mess up a social link. Probably for the better in my opinion. The second way happens when a character invites you over the phone to hang out on a day off. If you commit to spending time with one social link, but then later cancel on them to spend time with another, the former social link will reverse. This one can be kind of tricky since not all characters will call you at the same time every week, but you have a lot more foresight with this mechanic, so I think this one is pretty well justified to have. The third way, as mentioned earlier, is through making a gravely incorrect choice during very specific rank up events. The only way to restore your social link is to talk to them directly and apologize sincerely. I actually miss this part of social links quite a bit when I played the newer games. I feel something games don't do often enough is tell the player when they're wrong. Like, actually make them regret it. 
it's a hard pill to swallow, but in a social sim about being nice to people, I feel like something like this should just be a given. You might not feel like you did anything wrong at first, maybe even feel a bit frustrated at them yourself, but part of nurturing relationships or even just life in general is learning to say, I'm sorry. Not even out of admission that you're wrong, but just out of kindness and courtesy. Sometimes a nice gesture is enough to get someone to realize they might have overreacted, or they may have been in the wrong as well. I know telling this to people on the internet where common decency be damned is like talking to a brick wall, but I'm gonna be real here. I'm mostly just making this video for me. I like it because I like when characters feel like they have standards. It feels more realistic to me, and honestly kind of appeals to my cynical side who wants to teach those whippersnappers about being more humble. Jealousy mechanic aside, I'd honestly like to see the series take another stab at this approach. Oh yeah, that's another thing. Persona 3 is just too real sometimes. Like, painfully real. This could be to a detriment for some people, but I enjoy the immersion. You know, despite not playing these games until college, I actually found myself resonating way more with the setting and grind of Persona 3 than the other games. I think a large part of that is the amount of freedom and player agency you're given in this game. No parents, guardian figures, or cats to tie you down. Feeling exhausted whether it be from overexerting yourself or for literally no reason at all. I hear a lot of people complain about the stamina system in this game, but outside of combat and dungeon crawling, it's actually not that restrictive. You're still able to do just about anything else you want with your time aside from studying late at night because dude, get some sleep. In Persona 4 and 5, the game just decides for you that you're too tired after doing something, and you've essentially just burned through a day on one activity. And wouldn't you have it, there's actually one small benefit to being tired. You can get a free courage boost from drinking some sus medicine. That's a free stat point, with absolutely no time consumption. Some guides online will even tell you to stay sick for several days so you can bank on this. Okay, that kinda breaks the immersion factor, but still, it's either frustratingly real or hilariously exploitable, and I'm all for it. Another aspect to my immersion is the game's setting. I grew up in the city, not like the big city city, just a city. In terms of what there is to do, there's mostly just food and shopping. So yeah, I guess it was a lot like Iwatodai in Tatsumi Port Island, huh? Not really a bad thing for me personally. A lot of the time I spent with my college friends consisted of strolling around the mall, ramen nights, and the VR cafe on rare occasions. Sometimes something eventful or memorable might happen, other times we just kinda chill or study and not much comes about it. Honestly, when I hear people rave about how they should make a Persona game about college students, I just kinda roll my eyes. Firstly, not everyone goes to college. High school, on the other hand, is something most people are forced to experience, even if it's just for a little bit before you have the option to drop out. Secondly, speaking from personal experience, I think Persona 3 already accurately depicts the grind of student life even for a college student. Again, living in a co-ed residence hall with no real authority to keep you on a leash is likely the biggest reason for this. Regardless of how you feel about how Persona 3 specifically implements its ideas, it lays down the groundwork and the overall bone structure that the later entries of the series would follow as well. It's effective and helps save time and money by reducing the amount of assets needed to be made. Even in a much larger scale game like Persona 5, I can imagine not needing to make any transitionary areas or overworlds and having mainly a handful of areas for the player to explore outside of dungeons lightened the burden on the developers. I have a lot of respect not just for the aspects that they kept in the later games, but also the more experimental aspects of Persona 3. For as brutal to the player this game is at some points, I genuinely think Persona 3 emulates life the most accurately out of the Persona games. Obviously, I'm speaking based on my own experience, but I think I've been alive long enough to confirm the accuracy of the things I just talked about. While we're on the topic of immersion, I guess now is a good time to address the elephant in the room. You may have noticed I've been using footage from both Persona 3 FES and Persona 3 Portable interchangeably. 
I received a copy of Persona 3 Portable on Steam from Atlas. Big thanks, by the way. So it felt like a good opportunity for me to cover both games in one video. I know that, for some reason, there's some controversy of which of the two versions you should play. I'll get more into the gameplay differences and other changes as the video goes on, but what I want to focus on right now is the presentation of Portable, as that seems to be the biggest point of contention. Persona 3 Portable completely replaces the 3D hub world maps with a 2D point-and-click interface, and dialogue is now conveyed through a visual novel-esque style. The debate is mainly about how much this actually hurts the game, specifically the story. There is a certain charm to strolling around the streets of Tatsumi and Iwatodai. Being able to explore actual set pieces through the story is pretty neat. I didn't even know you could go to this back alley they show several times throughout the story. And I remember the daily grind of going up and down the same hallways, the same streets, and seeing the same people every day. If you're someone who reads a lot of books and has a more colorful imagination than what PS2 graphics and FMVs can offer, then the change in presentation is a non-issue. In fact, I only see it being a problem for people who are used to the PS2 version. As someone who played Persona 3 Fest first, the impact of some of the key story moments is lessened by Portable. They put up a valiant effort adding new portraits and recreating certain scenes with the in-game graphics, but despite how low budget the anime cutscenes were, they did one key thing better. Portable has to add more lines and descriptors of what's going on due to the limitations of the format. The cutscenes are able to do more show and less tell. However, I don't think those things are nearly enough to ruin the experience. Persona 3 has a strong enough narrative to overcome that format. Also, the visual novel style is exactly that. It's mostly just an aesthetic. It's not like the characters in Portable have long inner monologues after every line of voice dialogue, like in other Persona games that take on this storytelling format. Persona 3 Portable's story, graphics aside, is told and conveyed in the same way as the original, with only a few more descriptive lines of text to compensate for the lack of visuals. In a vacuum, I'm sure most people would choose the awkward 3D graphics any day. There are plenty of neat little details, but there's way more to these games than just that, and you shouldn't solely base your decision off it. That's just being a class A graphics whore. I can't even really be too mad about the point and click stuff to be honest. For those of you who have seen my video on UI design in Megaten, you'll know that I believe interface is important in an RPG. This genre is very menu heavy by nature. Portable, in the face of its 2D restrictions, doubles down on its UI design and actually improves it compared to the PS2 versions in my opinion. Especially the HUD and text boxes. The designers were wary that you would be looking at them more. The point and click map scenes are also really user friendly. You can toggle the map icons with the press of a button, and navigating the cursor feels very fluid. You don't get to see the main character's portrait too often outside of the menu screen, so having that off to the side is pretty nice. Another nice touch I'm a fan of is the portrait and drop shadow they added to the choice box. Like, yeah, no hub worlds kinda sucks. But when the user interfacing is this well done, I can't bring myself to hate it. Besides, they still keep the 3D environments where they needed it. So in place of your nighttime activity, you also have the option to explore the big scary place at night that also happens to be your school. Wait, no, please don't withdraw your applications. The game establishes that the tower is constantly changing and will never maintain the same shape every time you visit. This is the in-universe explanation for the dungeon structure. Tartarus consists of randomized dungeon layouts. Unfortunately, the dungeons themselves aren't anything special. In Greek mythology, Tartarus is a dungeon in the underworld where the wicked are tormented and the titans are imprisoned. Not the Persona Titan, I mean the titans that were shooed out by Zeus. It certainly works thematically and atmospherically. I'm actually quite a fan of the aesthetic of Tartarus. It starts off as just a distorted school. As you go further up, you see the place mutate into weirder amalgamations. 
Yo, the backdrops at the end of every block look sick. The floors themselves are labyrinths in the purest sense of the word. Tartarus does not contain any puzzles or static gimmicks in each area. The problem with introducing actual puzzles into a dungeon that's supposed to last you the entire game is that it becomes a much slower and longer burn. Rather, the gimmicks, so to speak, will also occur randomly. Nothing too game-altering, it's mostly just in regards to the enemies and the treasure chests. Sometimes you'll get a floor with extra enemies, sometimes you'll get a floor that's stacked with gold chests containing the goods. Sometimes you'll get a floor with all gold shadows, and sometimes you'll get a floor with no shadows. In which case you might want to get out of there. The game also gives you all the tools you need to make the climb as painless as possible. You have the option to split your party up to either cover more ground as you move about yourself, or you could just wait and let your allies find the stairs or an exit point for you. Uh, this comes at the cost of not getting any XP, since the enemies won't spawn if you just hold still. But in cases where your party is starting to get worn out, this can be a worthwhile trade-off. Another good use of the split-up mechanic is to farm for chests. Chests are random, just like the floors, so this can be a good way to farm for items. In Persona 3 Fest, party members will keep whatever cash they find for themselves to buy their own equipment. Usually better than what they had equipped numbers-wise, but without any secondary properties. I usually like to sell whatever they got and keep them equipped on my stuff. In Portable, however, they will give you all the money they find. Either way, the dungeon is very conscious of what it is and doesn't try to overstep its bounds. The game is also pretty generous with how you pace yourself through these dungeons. Sure, your characters may get tired after a while, but there's no strict deadline when you have to reach the next roadblock. There is one really rare instance where the game forces you to go to Tartarus, but it only happens at the beginning of the game, and it only happens if you just completely ignore Tartarus. Character stamina will also grow exponentially as they level up. So if you pick and choose your fights wisely, you can clear an entire section of Tartarus in one night. In Persona 3 Portable, they nerf the stamina system really hard by making it so your characters won't become tired until after you've finished your excursion for the night. You can also buy these magic energy drinks to make you not tired anymore. Sounds like finals week in a nutshell. This might just be a me thing, but I personally find Tartarus and Persona 3 in general to be a very cozy experience. I remember pulling this game out to do a few floors of Tartarus and maybe a few social link ranks in between classes. On the other side of the coin, I remember wrapping myself up in blankets during those cold winter nights for hours quietly climbing the floors up to the next checkpoint, or figuring out the best Persona lineup for the tough boss fight. That satisfying feeling of ascending to the next block while the game shows you how far you've come. As that access point menu gets bigger, and that tower display gets higher, I feel like I'm becoming king of the hill. Slowly, but surely. Some bosses are laughably easy, and others hold up to their rank on the hierarchy, and really know how to put you in your place. Sometimes they'll start bringing up the heat right as they're on the brink of death. At the end of the day, it's not great, but it's not horrible either. I personally find it inoffensive at worst. Tartarus is very much a product of the change in formula, as I mentioned earlier. While you will visit other places during the dark hour on occasion, it's meant to become a normalized part of your in-game life. Even if you're not visiting super frequently, it's still one of the many places you'll be visiting time and time again over the course of the game. I'm honestly kinda glad the game seems very cognizant of that, because Persona 4 seems to try and compensate for it in all of the wrong ways. They focus way harder on the motif to make up for being randomly generated, all the while removing all the little things that made the dungeons feel random in the first place and even the layouts feel less conducive of the field encounter style approach. You can clearly tell the floors of Tartarus are designed for you to ambush and juke your way around enemies, with all the arches and other platform architecture. The dungeons in 4 are literally all flat and straight hallways, plus all the pathetic non-gimmicks they mandate on at least one floor of the dungeon feel obviously brute forced and ironically make the dungeons feel more padded out. The Persona 5 team seemed to have been aware of this when they designed Mementos and thankfully went back on their approach, 
while also providing more interactive and engaging dungeons separately. Sorry, I already made a video scrutinizing Persona 4. Which you should totally watch by the way, it's an underrated work. Besides, the fun comes from the hunt. When it comes to RPGs, I really value the battle system. I love seeing how different games put their own spin on the turn-based combat system. It takes such a big portion of the genre as a whole, and it's debatably the most fun part of it. So of course, we might as well start with Personas. They don't quite work the way they did in Persona 1 and 2. Only the protagonist is able to use multiple Personas and swap between them in battle. Fusing Personas works very similarly to how Demon Fusion works in SMT Nocturne. The main difference is that Personas upon fusion can receive an XP boost right off the bat, depending on how high your rank is with a certain arcana. This can encourage players to strategize around what social links they've advanced farther in by favoring personas of their higher ranked arcanas. Alternatively, this can motivate the player to advance through social links of a lower rank because they really want a persona of another arcana, but would like a larger XP boost so they don't have to grind for certain skills. Resultant demons can inherit skills from the fusion components. You can't manually select them, unfortunately. But thankfully, this game does give you plenty of ways to make up for any passive skills you might not have been able to get on a persona. This actually comes in the form of equipment. Think of your equipment setup as an extension of your persona build. The most fun part about an RPG, for me at least, is specking your party. Since only the protagonist has the ability to swap personas now, you need interesting ways to utilize your character's strengths, while also allowing for some flexibility. Persona 3 does this pretty well. Firstly, there's the weapon system. It's not like some RPGs where every character has a different weapon as an aesthetic. Persona 3 makes each weapon distinct with their own perks and drawbacks, in addition to having three different physical type attributes split amongst eight weapon types, six of which can be used by the protagonist. Having the main character be able to use most of the weapons allows the player to see the differences between each weapon type more clearly. Bows have low accuracy, but you will never stumble from whipping a hit. Fists deal less damage, but have the best accuracy of any weapon. The differences aren't just limited to battles. They also have different windups, swing speeds, and ranges on the field. This is sadly absent from the portable version of the game. It's probably because they didn't want to make animations for FemC using every weapon, so they took the easy way out and just had everyone use one. Unfortunate. Just little things like this can change the way you approach enemies and add just a little bit more thought into party management. But you're not going to be using weapons most of the time, you're going to be using persona skills. Weapons are for more than just attacking in this game. Weapon fusion is such an underrated mechanic in this game. So, as the name implies, you can fuse a persona into a blank weapon base, dropped by gold shadows. While the level determines the attack power, the arcana will determine the weapon's effect. You can get an assortment of pretty neat effects. Personas of the full arcana will each have their own unique effect, at the cost of having no attack power. Some personas yield special weapons regardless of what type of weapon you fuse them into. Some of them can change the attribute of the user's basic attack and or boost a certain element. Stack this with an accessory with a passive amp to that element, and you essentially have a character proficient in two different elements. This makes characters like Akihiko and Ken some of the most versatile characters in the game. You can also double down on a character's designated element if you want to. Now, imagine the possibilities for your protagonist. Pretty much all types of normal equipment have a wide range of random bonus effects. You may notice that equipment doesn't stack. That's because two pieces of equipment, even of the same name, may not be exactly the same. On very rare occasion, you might even get a piece of armor that resists an element. A piece of armor might be worth keeping just for that, even if it has really low defense. This is something I like in other RPGs as well. Persona 3 introduces the one more mechanic into the series. Hitting an enemy with their weakness or scoring a critical hit will knock down the enemy. Knocking an enemy down grants the character that just attacked an extra turn. Hitting enemies that are down already won't grant you a one more, but if you keep up the momentum by exploiting each and every enemy's weakness, 
you can knock them all down, leaving them open for an all-out attack. There are some cases where not going for the all-out attack might be better, hence why the option to relent is there. You can use this opportunity to set up instead, or capitalize on skills that deal more damage to downed foes. In the PS2 versions of the game, getting back up uses up that character's action. So this can be exploited to what is essentially a stun lock. However, this is more of an emergency safety measure rather than the norm. Drawing out an entire fight like this just wastes time, it's suboptimal, and is just less fun than pulling off a more hands-on strat most of the time. In the portable version, it follows the Persona 4 rules of knockdown. Getting up from a knockdown does not use up a turn, but getting hit while you're knocked down may make you dizzy, and will prevent you from getting up for one turn. It's like a more lax version of Shin Megami Tensei's press turn system. On one hand, this makes the battle system easier to get into for people with very limited RPG experience. In the portable version, that is. On PS2, the stamina system plays a lot more into the dungeon crawling endeavors, but I already kind of explained everything you need to know about that earlier. This will affect how you will pace yourself while climbing the tower. While you could jump headfirst into every enemy, sometimes choosing your fights might be the better option. You could get a preemptive attack and then just run away to essentially delete enemies you don't want to deal with off the field. There's also a huge elephant in the room that I've been avoiding this whole time just for this specific point. In Persona 3 and Persona 3 Fest, you do not control your party members directly. Rather, you command your allies through the use of tactic settings you can set on the protagonist's turn. Instead of inputting commands traditionally, you manipulate the behavior of your party using general commands. So listen, I get why this system is unpopular. I understand why most people would prefer the method of most RPGs. It's simply a matter of convenience. However, the notion that this system is luck-based or that it's largely RNG is just straight up disingenuous. While your list of tactics starts off pretty meager, your party will learn more over the course of the game. Before even the halfway point of the game, you'll have more than enough to control your party effectively. The biggest problem I tend to see with people is that they seem to treat the default act freely command as some sort of magic catch-all, when really they should be relying on it less as the game progresses. Why else would they be giving you more commands? Sure, in the early game, it works fine because your characters have very limited starting skill sets, so the initial list of tactics is fine for the time being to ease the player into the game. But as battles become more challenging, and as your character's skill sets become more varied, you need more specific priorities for them to deliver on. Bruh, Knockdown is so good, it's what I use for most regular encounters. While it might be a bit odd that your characters are single targeting, it's actually safer because multi-target spells have lower accuracy. And if you're wondering how big of a difference that makes, this is actually what speedrunners will opt to do with the protagonist. Yeah, that's right, the AI knows the speedrun strats. It also actually saves you SP in the long run, because they're only using it on enemies that are weak to their magic. You also have tactics to prioritize high damaging skills, support, singling down enemies to lessen incoming crowd damage. A lot of it comes down to categorizing skills and knowing which ones are applicable to which tactic. Persona 3 is the only game in the series where you can weakness scan enemies right from the start, and this ingrains the enemy's weaknesses and resistances into your party's memory, so they only use what can work. It even works on bosses that hide that shit from the player. You can't see it, but your party knows what's up. On top of that, you have the ability to see the order of the entire turn cycle, so you can assign commands accordingly. Planning on a cycle by cycle basis instead of turn by turn is key. Yukari's not going to be able to heal until after the enemy goes? Maybe I should heal instead this turn and set her to full assault. My party members are refusing to use their physical attacks? Maybe the enemy is immune or has a high counter skill. Persona 3's combat is far more versatile than people give it credit for. Okay, but why deal with all of that when you can just give the player full control? While I could easily respond by asking why bother inputting the same exact commands every turn when you can just change them situationally? Why have fixed camera angles and tank controls when you could just have normal fucking controls? 
I don't know, maybe because constantly jumping between fixed camera angles works better for tension? Persona 3's battle system emulates the feeling of team synergy very well. Working with people can be frustrating. You ask someone to do something, and they might not do it exactly how you want it. However, if you take the time to learn how a person operates and what they excel at, you can capitalize on their strengths and get good results. What these two controversial control schemes have in common is that they limit the player's control in exchange for something more benefiting for their respective types of games. Survival horror games are meant to keep you on your toes and struggle your way out of tense situations. Persona 3's tactics and how well the player uses them reflects that synergy and how well the team is able to work together. And yes, I know about the mod that lets you directly control your party. You literally cannot go 5 seconds without somebody mentioning it. If you say you're about to play this game for the first time, you are guaranteed to get a bunch of people telling you that this game is impossible to enjoy without it. I genuinely feel bad for these people just trying to get excited for a game, and the first thing they hear is, THIS GAME IS SHIT UNLESS YOU PLAY IT WITH THIS MOD. Look, I'm not gonna reach through your screen and stop you from using it if you really want to use it that badly. It just rubs me the wrong way how people will get this mad just because they tried doing something different. Different doesn't always mean good, but it's hard for devs to even try when people will immediately shoot you down for it. Also, the fact that people are more willing to put up with all these bugs, and more importantly, the potential for your game to softlock in battle than just figuring out how the AI works for a fully stable experience should say enough. Even the showcase for this mod by the dev makes it pretty obvious that this is more just a proof of concept than anything. If you really want direct control over your party, I would honestly just suggest the portable version. It includes both that and the updated knockdown mechanics of Persona 4, so you can get the most out of it. Ultimately, it's a preferential thing, and most people lean heavily towards the more common and convenient option. That is perfectly fine. In a perfect world, we could have both, like in Dragon Quest VIII. A game that defaults to having characters follow orders, but still has good AI settings. Instead, we're left with only four tactic commands and way worse AI that's not even worth using in the later games. And let's be honest here, you were gonna blame everything on the characters whether you had direct control or not. Don't lie to me, I've seen the way you people play these games. And I know you can technically brute force your way through the game without putting too much thought into the tactics, but you're only making the experience more frustrating for yourself. You can get by with a bare minimal understanding, but the game is far more rewarding to those who actively take advantage of the tools the game gives to you. Is it perfect? God no. I've played Fest like five times on hard mode. I know the AI's flaws better than anyone. Healing priority is based on integer value rather than the amount relative to a character's maximum. This can lead characters favoring Yukari when it comes to heals because she has the smallest HP pool. The threshold for party-wide healing spells is pretty stingy, being two characters below half HP. I personally would have made it more like two-thirds. I have never seen Yukari use Charmedy, ever, even when characters are charmed. Igis doesn't seem to understand that buffs do not extend if you recast them too early, though this would have been good in the newer games. There doesn't seem to be a consistent priority for what order buffs and debuffs are casted, those are just to name a few. It has its flaws, but 90% of the time, it works. The margin of error is pretty small, and the things I've mentioned can be worked around if you stay conscious of them. For example, if you're not within the party-wide healing threshold, you may want to consider setting the entire party to heal for that turn, or just do it yourself. Like it or hate it, Persona 3 is where Persona would really start to get their stride in turn-based combat. Persona 1 and 2 had ideas that I appreciate, but really lack identity. Like, what do people call Persona 2's battle system other than the Persona 2 battle system? One more may not be as good as SMT's press turn or as well known as Final Fantasy's active time battle, but it had something snappy and addicting to call its own. It wasn't simply riding the coattails of SMT's demon summoning and fusion anymore. 
Hey, if you watched this far into the video, I just want to give a huge thank you. This is a passion project that I've been wanting to do for a while now. I tried making a video like this in the past once, but I didn't say nearly as much as I wanted to say, plus my writing and editing weren't as good back then. I wanted something that meets my current standard of quality, and something that I know will hold up even as I continue to improve. You know how they say, time is money? Well, projects like this one take a while to make. If you'd like to help make up for the loss, consider checking out my Patreon. Your support can go a long way in helping me diversify my content. Right now, my plan is to start dipping my toes into challenge runs. God help me. I'd also love to do more non-Megaton content one day, but that usually never works out. Don't get me wrong, I can talk about Megaton all day, but even if I want to make a video on something else just once, that's time I could have spent making a video that would perform much better. If I receive enough support from you, I'll be able to make videos on any topic I want without needing to worry about YouTube's arbitrary policies resulting in limited ads or chasing the algorithm. But we all know that's never gonna happen. Huh, <laughs> I'd like to see you prove me wrong. I dare you. I recently posted a thumbnail collection, and I think I might start posting more exclusive content like that there. Also, I'm going to be delving into major spoiler territory from here on out. That includes a little bit of the other games too. If you're trying to avoid spoilers, or if everything I've said so far sounds too insane to be true, now's probably the best point to drop off and play the game yourself before continuing. Okay, thanks. Back to the video. Persona 3 easily has my favorite cast of main characters in the series. Again, the keyword here is organic. I hear a lot of people complain that the members of Seas don't feel like friends. That is absolutely absurd to me. Of course they feel like friends. They're just not best friends. At first. I gotta be honest with you, I don't think simply being friends who hang out a lot is an interesting enough dynamic to really resonate with me. Or rather, it's not really worth anything to me unless you see it develop over time. The members of Seas are very deliberately kind of distant from each other at first, and very understandably so. From each of their perspectives, you're just some rando who happens to have a persona. And once I start dissecting each character individually, you'll see that these are definitely not the types of people to just open up to each other immediately like that. For now, I want to focus on the group dynamic of Seas and why I think it's underappreciated. I never lived on campus during my college years, but I did spend a lot of time on campus. Most of my friends lived there, after all, so it was just the most convenient rendezvous point if we wanted to hang out. The relationship Seas has throughout a large portion of the game is fairly accurate to what I've seen personally. Very often, when my friends and I are coming in, someone else is heading out. Sure, my friends usually get along with their roommates just fine. Sometimes they'd even sit down and chill with us. Sometimes. Most of the time though, roommates will just kinda mind their own business. Everyone has their own lives and their own little circle of friends. That includes you, the protagonist. Of course, these characters are pretty important and you're all working towards a common goal. So of course, they're gonna have to bond and really come together on this at some point. The course of the story gives them a very natural bond progression. At the beginning, you and your roommates are kinda divided into separate little cliques. You, Yukari, and Junpei are in the same class, so you get along well. Fuka follows suit and sorta of flocks toward your side of the group when she joins. Mitsuru and Akihiko are in the year above you, and have known each other since middle school, so they mainly just talk to each other. The point where you really start to become close is when your club advisor, Ikutsuki, sets up an impromptu vacation for you guys. The trip over there is silent and awkward, but then you start to see a spark form. Some fun at the beach, some bro bonding over some failed attempts to pick up girls. You see everyone start to break out of their shell a little. You take in a persona using dog, and the game starts giving you opportunities to make small talk while walking the dog. You even start inviting them out for movie marathons, going out for ramen casually, and celebrating New Year's together. 
One of the reasons I'm not as crazy about the characters of Persona 1 or 2 is because I don't feel like they're explored enough. In Persona 1, character arcs just fade in and out of existence aside from Maki. In Persona 2 Innocent Sin, character arcs are given a strong start, but feel like they're left hanging until the end of the game, only to have all the details just dumped on you. Eternal Punishment has good characters that explore interesting themes, but I feel like Ulala's arc could have been explored more. Everything I feel about Persona 3's main cast and how they grow both together and individually feels more earned. They were all given enough time in the oven. Some characters are eating more well than others, but we'll get into that shortly. Individually speaking, I guess there's no better character to start with than Yukari. Don't get me wrong, I totally get why she can be irritating for people. On a surface level look, she just seems like your typical girl character who complains a lot whenever anything dire happens. You could liken her to someone like Yuzu in Devil Survivor, although I'd argue Yukari is better. I didn't really think that much of her when I first played the game. I was pretty neutral about it. It was only in retrospect upon returning playthroughs where I really looked at her interactions with everyone and paid more attention to the bigger picture did I really start to appreciate her. The game does a really good job characterizing her within just the opening hours, honestly. You know she's afraid to summon her persona, and she's the only one to really feel bad for monitoring you and learning your backstory of your parents dying. Even as you're introduced to her, she feels the need to make sure you're okay after seeing the dark hour. She sympathizes with being in your position. When the dorm is attacked by a shadow, she's given the task to protect you, but ultimately lacks the courage to defend both you and herself. After awakening to your persona and going into a week-long coma, she makes the effort to make up for hiding the truth from you and tries to relate to you a bit. This girl literally pours her heart out for you, despite being someone who normally keeps people at arm's length. She is such a sweetheart. You see her extend her sympathy to other characters as well, such as Fuka when she feels as though she was being pressured into joining Seas, or Mitsuru when she lost her father, something that Yukari was all too familiar with, but I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. Her social link expands on her family situation even more. I regret not getting past rank 2 on my first playthrough, she already had a good arc, but this social link is where I realize that she's truly the most realistic character in this game. You find out exactly how much the death of her father really damaged her. It kind of ruined her relationship with her mom. The first you ever hear of her mom is when she just suddenly calls Yukari to tell her that she wants to get married to her current boyfriend. Sure, it's been about 10 years since her dad died. Theoretically, she shouldn't have a problem with this. However, you're given more context of the situation afterwards. Apparently, Yukari's mom has been jumping from guy to guy a lot since her father's death. I used to believe that this was possibly an exaggeration on her part. Perhaps her mom was just trying to move on in a very normal manner, and Yukari just couldn't accept it at first. Upon further thought, though, I don't think there's any reason not to believe her. If you remember during the story, one of the full moon operations took place at a love hotel. Upon confronting the lover's shadow, she says, Because of you, I had to come to this disgusting place. Yukari very likely hates hookup culture because of her mother. Regardless of that though, I don't think it's really good to just start dating around again without considering the feelings of your kid. Lack of communication is the root of a lot of issues between kids and their parents, and it seems Yukari realizes this by the end of her social link and she decides to talk things out with her mom. Another controversial moment with Yukari is the one where she had her wallet stolen, and after helping her get it back, she seems really shaken up about it. It might be easy for people to make the mistake of hugging her in this situation. Again though, it only takes an extra moment of forethought to realize why that's the wrong choice. These thugs were clearly about to do… bad things to her. And then seconds later she sees you single-handedly send these three guys to the Shadow Realm. No signs of injury on your part, it just happens. Holy shit. General rule of thumb, don't make close physical contact with someone who was almost just sexually assaulted. 
Like, I don't blame anyone for making that mistake, but when you're in situations like this where there's a grave misunderstanding on both parties' parts, you gotta grow up. Swallow your gamer pride and apologize. Hell, she even apologizes to you too once you're able to pick her social link back up. That's another thing too, she has literally apologized for every time she's raised her voice at someone throughout the story. Even when she had a good reason for it, like when Mitsuru and Akihiko withheld important information from the newcomers. That includes you, the person they assigned as the leader. It did not take long at all for her to make amends. She apologizes to you pretty much immediately after she snapped at you at trying to console her. Bruh, she even apologized for playfully teasing Junpei when he really took it the wrong way. Meanwhile, you have people praising Chie, who is borderline cruel to Yosuke, and uses his money without his consent. But nah, Chie's okay because she never yells at you, the player. Saying Yukari complains a lot is reasonable, it's okay not to like that. Acting like her entire character is defined by negativity because she gets mildly annoyed every so often? Uh, kinda just sounds like straight up misogyny. This is not something I would say about any character back when I first played this game. I was a very different person back then. I valued logic and reason over considering the other party's feelings. When really, sympathizing with someone's feelings is the best way to get people to listen to reason. I think the most frustrating thing about discussing this character is that it just proves how difficult it is to portray characters with any kind of trauma or personal life issues accurately. People only want to see characters express their immense pain in the most idealized way. They want the romanticized version of the issue where the character puts their emotions aside and just pushes forward bearing it with a smile, or mask their pain with a positivity farce, or just dump all their baggage on you at once only for everyone to move past it just moments later. I'm often told that characters like this shouldn't be realistic to a painful degree but sometimes the reality of these types of issues is painful. To be clear, I'm not trying to tear down the other games to prop up another here. I'm simply just trying to point out what I like better between the games and what areas they do better than each other in. My bias may be showing a bit, but I'm not doing this at the expense of the other games. I like the other games. The point I'm trying to get across here is that we can't just shun the use of characters like Yukari because they hurt your feelings. Ironic I'm telling this to people expecting Yukari to just put her feelings aside and stop crying. Lover or hater, Yukari has value. Well, the most logical step after talking about Yukari would be to discuss Junpei. Again, another character who is pretty easy to dismiss at first glance. It's largely the same song and dance, he can be painfully cringe sometimes, but that's not his entire character. I've heard people say that Yukari is outright cruel to Junpei, and that being a large part of why people don't like her, and vice versa for Junpei of course. I've never seen it that way. Ever. Let's take a look at Yukari and Junpei's first interaction on screen. There are two ways you can interpret this scene. On one hand, Yukari immediately assumes that Junpei is either annoying you or just being a creep. Oh, what's with the immediate accusations here? On the other hand, some of the things Junpei says and does after that interaction can be interpreted that way. He persuades you into letting him walk you home, if you're playing as the female protagonist. That can definitely rub someone the wrong way. He also immediately starts prying into your business upon meeting him, especially as the male protag. Like, he doesn't outright make assumptions, but you can definitely tell by his tone, he was totally thinking, Yeah, this is epic. They're doing it. I don't know, I, I think Yukari has a right to clap back at him in a lot of these cases. I've seen some people act like the way Yukari and Junpei interact with each other is toxic. Like, Yukari calls Junpei stupe, and then people act like she just said a slur. When you actually look at their interactions together beyond the banter, you can actually tell they're good friends. In fact, they show concern for each other when the other is at a really low point. Anyways, as for Junpei as a standalone character, he is a hardcore coomer. There is no denying that. This guy goes nuts whenever he sees girls in bathing suits or kimonos, 
And when presented with the possibility of another girl joining the team, don't worry, we'll get to her, he's immediately got his eyes on the prize. He also feels as though he has a lot to prove, not having the best grades and not really being in any clubs. His persona power is the only thing that really makes him special. But when literally everyone else, especially you, is better than him at that aspect, maybe he's not even so good at that. He clearly holds some resentment towards you for getting to be the hero every time. What makes Junpei an enjoyable character in my eyes is seeing him become more than just his hormones and mood swings. What better way to round out a character like this than giving him the most unconventional relationship ever? Junpei's relationship with Chidori completely contrasts with the behavior that we're more used to from him. He obviously didn't fall for her looks, considering even he says she has a weird sense of fashion. He never makes any perverted jokes around her or talks about how badly he wants to see her in a bikini. What we do see is a more pure affection towards her, more opportunities to see the more caring side of Junpei. Even after finding out Chidori is part of Strega, a group of Persona users opposed to his cause, Junpei never stops showing concern for her or gives up on her, trying to set her back on the right path. You could say Chidori might have even given Junpei the sense of purpose he was looking for when she gave up her life to save him from a bullet wound. He's living for both of them now, so he can't let it go to waste. We see plenty of Junpei's better qualities outside of his relationship too. Like Yukari, Junpei will always apologize or make up for messing up, especially when he was aggressive towards the protagonist. In fact, he gives you way more shit than Yukari ever did. Good thing he's haha -ha funny man or else people wouldn't have taken his side nearly as much. Jokes aside though, I can actually respect that Junpei isn't afraid to be a dick to the protagonist sometimes. It's better than falling into the trap of becoming a yes man like I see in the other bro character archetypes. Not even in just Persona, honestly, I just mean in general. Though there are plenty of bro characters in other media who do nothing but fight with the main character. You gotta remember, Junpei is still the first person to approach you on your first day of school. He clearly wants to be your friend, and in the portable version, he actually goes the extra mile and hangs out with you regularly. Yeah, his social link in the female route is great. So, remember how Yukari told Junpei not to try anything funny on our female protagonist? Well, he kept his word on that. When some really stalker-ish photos of you start getting circulated around the school and someone shows it to him, he takes that copy away from him and then decides to take it upon himself to stop it. In a way, you could see this social link as a kind of redemption arc for the poster boy of sexual harassment. You also see him start putting more effort into his homework, he even opens up to you about his alcoholic dad. There is some mention of this during the story, but it's elaborated in his social link that his dad used to beat him, until eventually his dad became so weak that he didn't even really feel it anymore. Damn. While it's a shame the guy party members don't get social links in the male route, I can at least say that the female route is worth experiencing just for the new social links alone. He also turns you down if you confess to him. Damn, what a turnaround. Fuka is an interesting character. Her story significance wanes out pretty quickly, but there are still interesting facets of her character. For what it's worth, Fuka probably has the best debut in the story. First, they establish that Mitsuru is reaching her limits with her persona's navigation abilities, and that she's better suited for combat. They then introduce a character with the potential who sees initially writes off as too weak to fight. Then we hear rumors about how she might be dead because she hasn't been to school in 10 days. But it turns out she was actually just trapped in Tartarus, by herself. Granted, it wasn't actually for a whole 10 days, since the Dark Hour only exists for one hour a day. It was more like 10 hours, but still, everyone else only goes there for about one hour. She doesn't just have a navigator persona, but one that's purely suited for it. This setup arc not only did a good job hinting and establishing Fuka's powers, but was also just a generally good arc that occupied the better part of that month while also allowing the player time for their normal day activities. As for the rest of the story, we get a few good glimpses at her friendship with Natsuki. 
Now, to be clear here, this is the girl who locked her in the gym closet and left her there overnight. But Fuka forgives her because she's too pure. It's just a prank, bro. It alright. For what it's worth, though, at least her bully seems to genuinely regret it and actually starts being a good friend to her, up until the day she has to transfer schools. We also see Yukari and Fuka hitting it off pretty quickly. As I stated earlier, there was some concern over Fuka seemingly being pressured into joining the team, and just kind of accepting it on the spot. That's not the case at all though. Her family kinda has a complex because of all their relatives being doctors. Fuka just wanted to feel like she was genuinely being helpful or needed by people. In her social link, she tries her hand at cooking, and is horrible at it. This ultimately ends up being her journey into accepting herself for who she is and embracing her true talents in electronic devices. Despite this, however, she actually does get better at the thing she originally set out to do. I'm actually more fond of this social link in the female route. For one, the player one-upping Fuka at cooking and personally helping her to improve made the moment where Fuka finally succeeded in making something all the more satisfying. Just those extra moments like Fuka tinkering around with the oven, demonstrating her technical skills, or carrying around detailed cooking notes showing how committed she is to learning this craft makes this arc a lot more admirable in my eyes. Ultimately, Fuka has to learn not to just live and try to please other people or meet their expectations, like having traditionally feminine hobbies and just doing what she and only she can do to help the ones that she cares about. It's wholesome. While the game does take the proper time to explore her character, a lot of it is relegated to just her social link, and what there is during the story is kind of front-loaded. Oh boy, now we get to talk about Best Girl. Okay, don't get me wrong, Yukari is probably the best written female character, but Mitsuru, for me, was the most enjoyable. While you've got your normal girls like Yukari and your more quirky girls like Fuka, Mitsuru doesn't really fit either of those two categories. It goes a bit deeper than just being rich. Mitsuru has dedicated her life to Shadows, Studying, and the Kirijo group. So no, I don't really find it that surprising she hasn't eaten a burger before. If your complaint about this is that it clashes with the image of an intelligent girl she's built for herself, that's the point. Being smart doesn't mean you know everything about the world. My family didn't like spending money eating out because they thought that stuff was too overpriced, so I almost never ate out growing up, aside from occasional Chinese buffet for some momentous occasion. And that shit was paid for by my family. I didn't spend my own money on eating out until college. When I started eating at places that weren't just your run-of-the-mill food chain, it was… embarrassing, straight up. I didn't know how tip culture worked back then. Here in America, at least, it's considered rude not to leave a tip, and sometimes, it's basically mandatory. At McDonald's, they might just stare you down as you head out the door for not leaving one. At the restaurant where I learned about this, though, I got chased out the door by the waitress. It was so embarrassing. My friends and I were already at the car. Point being, yes, people like me actually exist. Like, there are so many places my friends will tell me about, and they'll be like, what? You've never eaten there before? You've never tried this? No. No, I haven't. Just stop looking at me like that. Mitsuru's lack of worldly experience isn't just limited to food etiquette, though. She has trouble grasping concepts like suspending your disbelief when it comes to movies. She mistakens a normal messy room for a robbery scene. Most importantly, for her social link, she doesn't quite understand love. Her concept of marriage is different from ours, as to her, marriages are done for business purposes. Her parents were arranged together, and she was also arranged with someone after her father died during the story. You know, despite how critical she is of rom-coms, Mitsuru's social link kinda plays out like one. And I am all for it. For the vast majority of the game, Mitsuru doesn't really hang out with anyone, aside from the impromptu beach trip and the class field trip where she finally starts to open up. Only after that can you finally form a more personal relationship with her, if you scored at the top of your class. Yeah, they make you work and wait to spend quality time with this character. Even before then though, she seems to kind of favor you over the others. 
offering rewards to only you for doing well on your exams, personally inviting you to join student council for... What role exactly? Mitsuru's the president, there's already a treasurer and a disciplinarian. I don't think we're the vice president. She says we don't even really have to come all the time, just whenever we want to, basically. Did she really need us there, or did she just want us to be there? Food for thought. The way she always asks you for favors and places high expectations for you feels akin to the way my old managers would do the same for me because they viewed me as their most reliable worker. Apparently. That relationship would evolve into something more intimate, though. If there's one thing falling in love will teach someone, it's to follow their heart. And that's what she decides to do instead of submitting to her arranged marriage with Douche McLean. Unfortunately, we don't get to beat this guy up like the guys in Yukari's Link, but goddamn, this protagonist is always ready to throw hands. The key word here when it comes to Mitsuru is isolation. She withheld the truth of the Dark Hour's origins from everyone. Even after the cat's out of the bag, Mitsuru gives Fuka access to the Kirijo Group's database to gather more information on the situation 10 years ago, instead of just asking for it directly. During the Yakushima trip, her dad lectures her about how she has a problem with not being upfront with her problems. She needs to learn to rely on others more. This is reflected by her relationship with her teammates before the Kyoto class trip. Aside from the protagonist doing his leader things, she doesn't really depend on anyone for anything. Mitsuru is trying to carry the burden of the Kirijo group herself because she feels that will help lift the burden on her father, which was placed on him by his father. But when Akutsuki suddenly reveals that he's Cray Cray, that hunting down the shadows was not actually going to put an end to the Dark Hour, that doing so was actually the catalyst for the world's end, and kills her father on top of that, she basically just lost everything she was living for. But with that comes her new purpose for living, to fulfill her father's dying wish. The person to finally get Mitsuru to open up more, or rather, the first one, is Yukari, who initially kind of hated her, mostly out of jealousy that Mitsuru still had her dad up until now. Funnily enough, Mitsuru states that she's jealous of Yukari to some extent. It's only a passing detail in some very specific moments that you might not even get to see. She says to herself that she'd never be able to pull off wearing pink the way Yukari does, and tells the protagonist outright that she gets jealous when he hangs out with other girls, citing Yukari as the first example. This could be rooted in some underlying desire to be more like a normal girl because, as we've clearly established, Mitsuru is… extraordinary to a detriment, we'll say. It's honestly kind of interesting to see who each girl compares themselves to, like, bro, they've got some serious self-esteem issues. Fuka says she doesn't look good standing next to Yukari? Oof. I don't know, maybe deep down I'm actually just a glutton for some juicy drama. Or maybe I'm extrapolating too hard on this. Moving on. I'm gonna be talking about Akihiko and Shinjiro together, because they work off each other quite a bit. I've seen a lot of people call a lot of the third-person cutscenes dedicated to individual character development as exposition dumps, especially with these two characters. I think this is kinda hokey, and I feel like the term exposition dump is becoming a buzzword. It might be true that taking the player out of the first-person lens momentarily might make them more wary of the details the game might be giving them in that moment. That doesn't make the interactions between the characters unnatural, nor does that mean they aren't allowed to allude to or hint at things. Why are they just talking about their past? Believe me, speaking from experience, as you get older you start to reminisce on the past more and more specifically with close friends who experienced that past with you. That's assuming they're still in your life now. Akihiko and Shinjiro are childhood friends who grew up together at an orphanage. They may not be as old as me, but they've certainly gone through a lot more than I did at their age. The same can be said of most of the main cast for that matter. They also don't just dump details on the player like some people like to insinuate. Like quite literally, 
These interactions are so brief and straight to the point that there isn't even enough room for that. Let's actually take a look at these two's interactions throughout the story and see exactly how much they actually dumped on us. In our first encounter with Shinjiro, he literally just passes you on the way out and Akihiko says, Yeah, I know that guy. What did we learn from this? That Akihiko and Shinjiro know each other? Okay, let's take a look at the conversation where they actually reminisce on stuff. What did we learn here? That these two go way back and Akihiko's holding something deep down. What about the parts where Akihiko is just updating Shinji on the situation? That Akihiko's subtly trying to get Shinji to come back. How damning. Oh, what about the time Akihiko's telling Shinji he shouldn't feel guilty about a thing that he did? Well, you see, that Japanese text in the background actually says Shinji killed Ken's mom. Except no, it actually doesn't. The only time they ever outright say shit is after building up to it for well over half the game, and then Akihiko snaps and admits he's hung up over the death of his sister. They don't explain the Persona Suppressants either until this point. Notice when Shinjiro buys the pills from Strega, they don't actually say anything about them. We just know he has them, so it makes sense for him to pull them out when Shidori's Persona starts attacking her. Then he explains that they're used to help stop Personas from going berserk. Then Akihiko infers that Shinjiro was using them for that purpose. It's such common sense storytelling, I can't believe I'm actually explaining it. Next you'll be telling me you don't know what a monologue is and call that an exposition dump too. Please tell me you at least read Shakespeare in high school. But enough storytelling 101, let's get into what really drives these characters. Akihiko has a constant drive to become stronger. This is both his greatest strength and fatal flaw. Actually no, it's a bit more complicated than that. Upon first meeting this character, you might see this quality in him and find it admirable. As time goes on though, you start to see this drive might actually be rooted in some deep-seated issues. Guy gets a little too eager to fight sometimes, and not in a shonen protagonist kind of way. It's an obsession that was brought up by the death of his sister, Miki, who died in a fire while the adults held Akihiko back from trying to retrieve her. As a result, Akihiko has this uncontrollable urge to never turn away from danger, or better yet, to always jump into it. Standing by and not being able to do anything probably just reminds him of the worst time in his life, where he couldn't do anything. You see this surface when deciding to replicate the method Fuka entered Tartarus with for the first time to try and find her. He seems really adamant on going through with the plan to save this person he hardly knows, even knowing the risk of getting lost in limbo. Akihiko, despite telling Shinjiro not to hold on to past trauma so much, has his own fixation, and Shinjiro calls this out. As for Shinjiro, he's more directly the cause of his own issues. Him and Akihiko were members of Seas before the events of the game, and on an operation, Shinjiro momentarily lost control over his persona, accidentally killing Ken's mom. This is not murder, mind you. Manslaughter is the correct term for this. Not that this really matters to Shinji. This doesn't make the guilt any less painful. It's because of this that Shinjiro basically wanted nothing to do with this Persona stuff anymore. He left Seas and tried to suppress his power with drugs. While they both have traumatic pasts, the two deal with it in dramatically different ways. Akihiko thinks attaining strength will help him prevent another tragedy like that of his sister's death from happening again, but to an unhealthy degree, while Shinjiro avoids fighting and believes there is nothing he can do to redeem himself. These stark contrast attitudes will ultimately lead these two to stark contrast resolutions, or lack thereof for one of them. I often hear that we don't get enough time with Shinji in this game. That is only partially true. He only joins you for a little over one month of the story, however, I feel we're given more than enough time during the story even before he joins you to get a good feel for this character. The only thing Shinjiro lacks is a satisfying conclusion to his arc, and that's because he's not supposed to. The nature of death is unpredictable. Yes, in theory, we can get a rough estimate of when a person should die on average. Realistically though, we have to take that with a grain of salt. 
Sometimes people die before they can tie up loose ends. Not everyone gets to knock everything off their bucket list. In Shinjiro's case, he was going to die no matter what. He basically accelerated his death due to the side effects of those persona suppressants. Considering he was aware of this, is it possible that maybe Shinjiro wanted to die or maybe just didn't care if he did? No conclusive answer, but the ambiguity probably makes it better. In his social link on the female route, you can start to see Shinji have second guesses. In said social link, you're shown a side of him that's only really hinted at in the story. He shows genuine concern for Aki, of course, but it starts to extend to the others too. Worrying about if they're eating well, teaching Fuka to cook properly, and even cooking for the entire dorm. Shinji is conflicted by this because he thought his path was set. He was ready to die, but now he's beginning to grow attachments to life. The biggest one being you. One of my favorite moments from his social link is the part where you and him just sit down and talk for hours. Or rather, he asks you to keep talking about yourself. He's trying to savor every last precious moment before he croaks. Shinjiro, in my opinion, is easily the best romance in Persona. Period. You cannot change my mind. And before you start crying about how this jeopardizes your precious Megaten timeline and how Shinji not dying lessens the impact of the game's story, firstly, screw timelines. They don't matter, and I don't even think Atlas cares about it either. You think they reference other games for continuity's sake? Hell no, they're doing it for nostalgia and fan service. Secondly, think about who this female route appeals to. It wasn't made just for female players, mind you. It was made for people who played the original and want a new experience. It'd be pretty lame if you went through all of this just to have the exact same outcome. I don't normally give a shit about shipping in general, but I think we should let these two have their happy ending. You can't get it unless you're on New Game Plus, but I think they deserve it. And then they got married and lived happily ever after. That is my canon, and I will not be taking any arguments. On the other side of the coin, we have Akihiko. While Shinjiro ultimately could not get over his guilt before dying, Akihiko is able to let go of his obsession with power. He's once again left in a position where he was powerless to stop someone close to him from dying. He turns his pursuit of strength into a more positive resolve. Before, he was just eager to run into combat to cope with his weakness complex. Now, he doesn't charge into combat, but rather, he'll never turn away from what he knows he has to do. You'll notice from here on out, he becomes the voice of reason in every dire situation from here on. Akihiko even gives Ken the push he needs to move past his own grief. Unfortunately, I don't have nearly as much to say about Ken as the other human characters, his arc pretty much ends shortly after it starts, and he really doesn't get much more afterwards. So, as stated earlier, Ken's mother was accidentally killed by Shinji's persona. Ken doesn't see it that way though. Shinji kinda messed up Ken's life. Kid's got no parents now, and no, I don't know what happened to his dad. When Shinji joins the party, you can clearly tell Ken's uncomfortable about it. He openly doubts Shinji's reliability and trustworthiness. To Ken's credit, he is very mature for his age, purely based on his mannerisms. He was kind of forced to grow up quickly due to the lack of his parents. Ken very quickly understands the risk of fighting and still volunteers to fight alongside Seas. Sure, it wasn't for the right purposes at first, but just the lack of fear in facing real-ass monsters is impressive. Ken is partially responsible for the death of Shinji as he was the one who brought him into the alley where his mother was killed alone. The original intent was to kill Shinji, but after finding out Shinji was gonna die anyway, Ken was just like, screw it, I don't care anymore. The leader of that Strega group I mentioned earlier, Takaya, uses this as an opportunity to kill one of them. Well, the one he really wanted to kill was Fuka. He said he was looking for the one that could help them sense the shadows so he could stop us from being able to track down and hunt them. More on that later. Ken, basically losing his only motivation in life to avenge his mom, lies and says that he's the one. Shinji jumps in the way and takes the bullet for him. Ken is now basically in the same situation that Shinji was in. 
A weird spot where he's partially responsible for someone's death, but is also kind of the main reason for it. He was so bent on blaming someone for his mom's death, and now, he's basically in Shinji's position. Unlike Ken, however, no one on the team blames him for what happened. He was given the mercy that he was unwilling to give Shinjiro. At this point, it all comes down to what he's going to do with it. He ultimately makes peace with his mother's death and decides to live for Shinjiro's sake too. Oh, by the way, did you know dogs could use personas? As early as his introduction, you get a hint that he has the potential when Fuka briefly senses something from him but then shrugs it off. The best quality of a dog is their loyalty, and they totally capitalize on that with Koromaru's character. He walks himself on the same path the now-deceased priest took every day and even protects the shrine from a shadow. This was apparently inspired by a real-life story of a dog named Hachiko. Just reading up on that right now, it's a really wholesome story. You know, some people might laugh at the prospect of giving a dog a social link in the female route. Honestly though, I've got more to say about Koromaru's social link than I do about Aki or Ken's. Their social links are more of the same qualities that we've already been shown of these characters during the story. Ken's was arguably more needed, but then it ends up going in a really weird direction. I don't think I need to talk about that. Koromaru's social link was genuinely enjoyable for me. Maybe it's just because I think the dog's cute, but you do get some genuinely good moments. Koromaru has a scar on his belly, likely from when he was attacked by that shadow when he awoke to his persona, and doesn't like being touched there. There is also a really wholesome moment where Koromaru takes some of his food to the shrine to feed a stray puppy there. There's also this other moment where he comes to the shrine just to howl out to his late master, and all the other dogs nearby howl back. It's about as much as you can do with a dog. It's much better that he's just a dog though, rather than an annoying talking dog. Like, if I had to hear this dog give a witty remark after every single thing, I'd probably go insane. Finally, we reach Igus. Igus is a character I like, but I wish I could like more. Igus is a character who is very much supposed to represent the themes of the story. She's the embodiment of them, practically. However, you really don't see any of the things she's meant to convey until near the end of the game. This includes her social link, which you can't start until January. For what it's worth, it's done very well once you get to that point. She raises very valid questions on what it means to live a meaningful life. For most of the game though, the game just hints that she'll eventually have the potential to become truly human, and then relegates her to comic relief. She interprets what Koromaru says to the party, questions the reasoning or purpose for human customs, and misinterprets or learns false information from either Yu or Jinpei. It's fine for the lighter-hearted moments, I just don't really love her like a lot of other people do. While I don't have a lot to say about her development-wise, one thing I might as well recap is her backstory. It'll make explaining the last portion of the story a lot easier. Igis is an anti-shadow suppression weapon. Before the events of the game, she tried to hunt down Death. Not to be mistaken for the Reaper, who is also called Death by Fuka. To prevent the coming of the fall. Too powerful to defeat, Igis seals away Death inside a nearby child who also got caught in the scuffle. That child was you. It's because of this that Death would take the form of a little boy visiting you throughout the game, pushing you towards finding the other shadows to ultimately bring him back. And by some stroke of fate, you ended up being drawn back to the town where it all started, and sparked the potential within the people around you. Well, came back he did. He takes the form of a transfer student named Ryoji, and Igis immediately has a fight or flight response whenever he's around. This basically explains her fixation on protecting the protagonist, though this would eventually develop into a more genuine affection for them. Again, she's clearly supposed to be important to the plot, I just don't really feel anything towards her. It feels more like the game was writing her character concurrently with the plot instead of developing as an already existing character. I think she has great development in the answer, but I already made a video about that. 
Bottom line with the characters, they're all tied together by a common thread of losing someone precious to them, but then using said loss to advance their character arcs and mature. Fuka didn't lose anyone to death, but the same principle applies. Aigis being the only exception, but keep in mind that she really only starts being alive very late into the game. So I guess it all works out in the end. I won't be painstakingly analyzing every social link character, because that's not really how I roll with these videos. Instead, I'll do something similar to what I did in my Persona 4 video. I'd rather focus on the common threads between them and shout out a few of my personal favorites. I think Persona 3 social links are quite underrated. I hear often that they're the worst as a result of being the first. I could not disagree anymore. Something important worth noting is that the developers never really intended for players to like every social link or even try to complete them all. They really just expected players to gravitate towards a handful of their favorites. You know, like a normal social sim. It's very clear they're supposed to appeal to a wide range of different people to varying degrees. The problem with trying to make characters in a social sim universally likable is that they end up being lukewarm. I think the fun in discussing the Persona 3 social links is seeing where people differ in their opinions. What do you see in this character that I don't? There is very little of that in Persona 4 and even less of that in Persona 5. In the Persona 4 video, I literally listed one of the most hated and one of the most overlooked social links as my favorites. I didn't even know the latter was underrated until someone told me they were, apparently. Sure, there are universally liked and universally disliked social links across all the games, but I feel Persona 3 offered the most down-to-earth roster of characters. Again, I reiterate, Persona 3 is organic. You're not gonna like everybody. You probably won't even like everyone you do like equally. There will be people who kind of annoy you, who will still just keep talking to you no matter what. Maybe you'll even grow a little attached to them. I feel like this kind of fits with the position the protagonist is in. Based on his demeanor, he doesn't exactly come off as someone who's eager to make tons of friends with people at his new school. It's more like he's thrown into a position where he has to. Well, technically you don't have to from a gameplay standpoint, but it'd certainly benefit you. Not just for the tangible benefits, of course, it benefits your personal growth too. So while you might not love everyone around you, it's honestly endearing to see the protagonist putting in the effort. Finding all sorts of different people by going to all sorts of different places. Something else Persona 3 did really well was making the world feel more interconnected through the social links. Sometimes you'll be required to progress far enough in one social link to meet a new character and initiate a link with them later. Other times it's just neat to see how some characters just know each other. I would have never guessed that Hidetoshi and Keisuke were best friends. Yukari and Yuko knowing each other makes sense because Yuko's a team manager. Of course she'd be mingling with some of the other student athletes. Yeah, I know not every social link is a must-play banger. Kenji, the first social link, is exactly that. He's definitely the first one. I mean, you should still do his social link because Cert is an amazing persona. I just meant he's not going to be anyone's favorite. To his credit though, he does demonstrate what a social link really is and how you should generally go about them. People like seeing a little bit of themselves in other people, so oftentimes the response they want to hear is the most optimal one. A commonality you'll see throughout social links is that many of the characters will have a set path in life, or rather they're under the impression that they're on a set path. This can either be because they have chosen that way of life and are hell-bent on sticking to said path, or they might be under the impression that they can't do anything about it. It can't be helped. Other social links might involve characters who aren't sure what they want to do. They might feel aimless and then later find something in life to pursue. 
Nothing is set in stone, things can change on a dime, for the better or to your inconvenience. Either way, it ultimately comes down to you to take action and take control of your future, pretty much aligning with the overall message of Persona games in general. I know this video is supposed to be about how this game changed the series, but I guess some things will never change. There's also some mumbo-jumbo about how each character portrays characteristics of the arcana they represent. While that stuff can definitely go a long way in helping you appreciate the social links more, I'm not really an expert or enthusiast on that kind of stuff, so I won't really be talking about it. But now we get to the part you've been waiting for. Which social links do I like the best? The answer might surprise you. No, this is not a countdown list. I'll be talking about these in no particular order. I'm sure everyone who is into the Persona franchise and their mothers have heard about how great Akinari the Sun social link is. A man destined to die of his incurable disease, with the only thing left for him to achieve in life is to finish writing his book. He at first has trouble coming up with an ending to his book, but through learning that one's life is important, even if no one knows you existed or acknowledges it, he weaves that message into the ending of his story. Many will tout this social link as being the best one in the game. I kind of agree with this sentiment, but I won't dwell on it too much because I want to highlight the more underrated picks. This one might tilt a few heads, but Mamoru of the Star Arcana really resonated with me personally. I've seen some people liken this social link to Kazushi of the Chariot, and even say that they're basically the same. This makes me want to bang my head against the wall, literally the most surface level assessment ever. Mamoru has a craft that he's really good at, his sport, which just also happens to match whichever one you chose. He seems to have his work all cut out for him. He even talks about getting into college with sports scholarships. This is all turned upside down when his mom gets hospitalized. Mamoru is left with no other choice but to give up on his sport and his chance at college education to work at a factory to take care of his family. Compare this to Kazushi's situation, where Kazushi is the one who gets injured, but chooses to keep pushing onward to help inspire his nephew in rehab. The reality of the situation though is that he needs to swallow his pride and take care of himself, which is a way better example for his nephew to follow. What? You're saying those two scenarios aren't the same? I agree. Kazushi will be able to compete again, eventually. Mamoru has basically just relegated the sport to just being a hobby at this point. He had a lot more on the line than just his pride. While I won't deny the slight similarities, I don't think it makes one less necessary than the other. I can imagine a lot of people relating to Mamoru's situation. Giving up your dream is probably one of the hardest things a person can do, and there's always the chance that you'll end up regretting it one day. There will always be a part of you that'll wonder, what if? Mutatsu, the tower social link, is another one of my personal favorites. I can relate to his cynical worldview. It's not as scummy as, say, Tanaka's. Just really pessimistic. But he's just trying to be realistic. To a detriment. He says that when it comes to relationships, each party will always want something out of it. That's not untrue, but then he comes to the conclusion that the only person who is really looking out for you is number one. There is some truth to this. It reminds me of a TED talk I saw once where they said, there's no such thing as unconditional love. Would you really say you'd be friends with your best friend no matter what? You'd have to draw the line somewhere. Even in religion, or at least the religions I grew up around, you're taught that you'll be saved, so long as you believe. <gasps> A condition! He suggests that you stop having expectations in life so you'll never be disappointed. Again, not entirely wrong, it's best not to have too many expectations or to set them too high, but you shouldn't settle for less if you can do better. I can't really find myself fully disagreeing with what he says, but that's honestly kind of the beauty of it. At the end of the day though, his cynicism is a result of his family leaving him. It's not clear what exactly he did to warrant this. Mutatsu initially seems like he'd fall into the 
I already have a path set in life model I mentioned earlier, but he actually falls a little bit more into the aimless without a goal model towards the end. I can really respect how he decided to go out of his way to find his family and vows to beg them for forgiveness. It's a different angle on a broken family than the examples people usually point to, which I appreciate. Okay, that's nice and all, but what about the female route? You've already gone on record saying it's worth experiencing if not just for the exclusive social links. Yes, I still stand by that statement. Admittedly, a large number of them are party member social links, however I do think the two completely original characters for the female route are pretty damn good. Yes, I said both of them. I know a lot of people might disagree with me on this, but I actually enjoy Ryo's social link. Unironically. Most people are turned off by the drastic turn from Ryo's inability to get along with her teammates, to her inexperience with romance and her feelings for... Kenji of all people. I think most of these people just have a hate boner for Kenji, which I totally understand, but come on, don't take it out on the poor girl. Like, I'm sure we've all had the experience of sharing each other's crushes with our friends, and then you have the one friend who comes out with the most out-of-left-field, unexpected person you could think of. I also don't think the shift in focus was uncalled for or too big of a diversion from the initial problem. Initially, Ryo is the only one who really cares about the sport and is trying, while all the other teammates are more preoccupied with stuff like boys and hanging out. Realistically though, the reason we even have this dissonance in the first place is because she doesn't understand why they care about that stuff in the first place. She can't relate to them and therefore can't sympathize with their lack of motivation. The idea they're trying to get across is that the root of the issue was a lack of understanding between Ryo and her peers. Notice how after she confesses to Kenji that she gets along better with her teammates now. Ryo is able to understand that they're young and they need to have fun, and her teammates are able to understand that Ryo really cares about the sport and needs a supportive team to back her up. Then there's Saori, one of the most depressing social links ever. There's a lot to unpack with this social link. Honestly, if you want the best deconstruction of this social link, you should probably just watch Fither's video on it. Pretty much says everything that needs to be said about it. If you want my two cents, I think Saori is kinda relatable. Obviously I'm not talking about what she goes through. I've never even met anyone who has gone through as much suffering as her. I mean her personality. She's passive and doesn't want to cause trouble for anyone. So she doesn't really express her own opinions on things when confronting people, and ends up getting taken advantage of by her classmates as a result. But of course, being a punching bag is not the way to live. It's Kinda too little too late by the time she figured that out though. Her reputation got destroyed by both her shitty peers spreading lies about her, and some photographer taking a photo of her to write a fake smut article on her. It got so bad to the point where she had to transfer schools. This isn't even all the suffering she went through. She went through a whole heap of shit before she even came to your school. And throughout the entire social link, her parents consistently placed the blame on her. Despite all of this though, Saori gained one good thing throughout all of this. A true friend. And at the very least, she can take what she learned here and use it to live a better life. While the social links in this game aren't as well liked, I'd still say the peaks in Persona 3 are much higher than those of 4 or 5s. Persona 3 social links capture a variety of different types of people and situations that I can personally appreciate more. Even though I miss some of the more punishing aspects like reversing social links, the fundamental aspects of the game here continue to be used today in mostly the same way. Sure, the games really place a lot of their eggs in the social sim basket, but it's still an essential part of the experience. If you were to remove these entirely and strip the game down to just its main plot points, you'd essentially just have the movies. And in my opinion, the movies feel kinda hollow. The passage of time and the slowly growing bond between the characters doesn't mean anything to me without actually experiencing the day-to-day -day life aspect. You don't get the impression that the main characters needed time to become closer friends without seeing how much time you actually spend away from them and see them out living their own lives. That includes you. 
A Persona 3 where I can't hang out with Yuko or visit the nice old couple at the bookstore sounds extremely unfulfilling. A Persona game where I can be rude and neglective to my friends with no consequence would feel very shallow. Regardless of whether you agree with me or not, social links in general are the soul of the modern Persona games, and have become a staple of the series as well as part of its core identity. They're the reason Persona became more than just an RPG. Alright, so I'm basically just doing this out of tradition at this point, but you know I gotta talk about the music. You know, for a game that's very overly characterized as edgy, this game has some of the chillest music in the series. A lot of the soundtracks in this game are just a vibe. A nice contrast to the more intense and darker nature of the narrative at large. While I wouldn't blame anyone for finding the music repetitive, it was never really an issue for me personally. I'm the type of person who catches earworms very easily, and thus I'll enjoy hearing the exact same music over and over and over. The music becomes about as routine as your day-to-day -day life. I appreciate how the school's theme changes with the season, specifically when you come back from a long break. At the beginning of the game, the school feels very new to you, so the music sounds really classy. When I first played the game, I thought it sounded more like shopping mall music. After spending a whole month away from the place, you come back to it and the place has become very familiar to you. Thus the music reflects this with a much warmer sounding track. For the final month of the game, the music becomes very nostalgic. It's become a place where a lot of the people you care about are. I know a lot of people like to complain about the music in Tartarus, but I swear it gets way better from Block 3 onward. Speaking of which, I'm actually a fan of the subtle change in between each section of Tartarus. When you listen to them all back to back, it's actually a really nice composition.
While we're going off on Tartarus, I don't care what anybody says. Mass Destruction is a fun song. I like it purely because of how different it is from what you'd expect from a turn-based battle theme. Gone are the days of MIDI music. Persona's going modern? They're modernizing the music too. Master of Tartarus is also just straight up one of my favorite boss themes, period. This song goes hard, but at the same time, it's kind of befitting for just stopping and taking a second to think before your next move. A very unexpected duality for a boss theme. And of course, the music is just as good on the flip side, in Portable as well. The female root has some of the most infectiously catchy songs, period. I often hear that the female root feels too happy, and that it ruins the atmosphere. These people seem to be missing the whole concept of playing through the game as an entirely different character. It's meant to be different. While the male root features very chill and laid-back music as you stroll through the town casually, the music in the female root almost kind of reflects a whole different perspective of the world around you. If the whole point behind the game is that death doesn't discriminate, I don't see why happier people should be excluded. The idea that Persona 3 has to be this constantly moody and dark game, which it really isn't most of the time, just makes it sound really pretentious. You could say that the FemC sees the world as a much warmer place, despite some of its more cruel aspects. I also love how all of her tracks share a leitmotif that really brings them all together.
And now it's about time we tie everything we just learned today back to the narrative and its primary theme, mortality. So throughout the story, we are led to believe that defeating the 12 Arcana Shadows that appear every full moon will relinquish the Dark Hour. When this is later all revealed to be a farce, and find out that the end of the world is coming, your entire world, or everything you thought it was, comes crashing down. You are presented with the ultimatum to either forget everything and just let it all happen blissfully unaware, or to spend every remaining waking moment just waiting for Doomsday to come. I know later games would also present dilemmas like this that also do a good job tempting you to take the easy way out, but Persona 3 started that trend and it's still going strong. Most bad endings in other games, including Mega 10 games, tend to be pretty generic, worst possible outcome, you suck type beats. Persona 3 doesn't shame the player if they choose to die peacefully in their last moments. When stuck in a truly hopeless situation, is there really a wrong answer? There's an awkward, dead silence throughout the month of December. While I often hear complaints about how this month is dead and a waste of time, I think, these people kinda trippin'. Silence can speak volumes, and while the silence persists, what else are you really supposed to do? The only thing you can really do is continue to live your life normally. All the while, the game shows multiple characters coming to their resolution spread throughout the month. And while you may have finished most of your favorite social links by now, this month could be a good opportunity to give some of the other people you don't really talk to a chance. I find this kind of befitting, actually. You're so mortified by the prospect of your own death that you start to reevaluate your relationships and how you've been spending your in-game time. Lastly, this decision ain't small potatoes. This is a choice between death and death but painful, but at least you die on your feet. Realistically, you would need that much time to contemplate. Well, they make a pretty good case for standing their ground. While everyone is shaken by their impending doom, they all ultimately decide that if dying is inevitable, they'd rather die for their right to live instead of just surrendering their lives. Death, at least in terms of the Arcana, doesn't necessarily refer to physical death or mortality. It can also represent change, while the inverse represents stagnation. Throughout the game, every character ends up losing someone close to them usually in the form of literal death, with Fuka being the only exception, but those losses triggered a change, not just altering the course of their life, but also triggering a change within themselves. In the bad ending, you literally see everyone revert back to their initial selves. It actually does a good job proving how much everyone really did develop. But then, you discarded all of it, and thus turning this tale into the reverse death. And let me tell you, the moment you choose to stand your ground, everything from there on just hits so much harder. The world you once knew was starting to give up on itself. Posters and graffiti markings of occult symbols slowly begin to litter the city. A very large concerning amount of people are being drawn to said cult. The cult's influence has even reached people in your school. Some of them are very devout members dedicated to the coming of Nyx, while others might be more casual believers or are just into it because it's trendy. And who better to be leading the hive mind than Strega themselves? While Takaya and Jin are very underdeveloped as characters, only really having their background as Kirijo test subjects to fall back on, Strega as a group works well as an antithesis to the main cast. When they're first introduced, they cling onto the Dark Hour and place their own self worth in it because of their persona powers. As they oppose your cause to defeat the Arcana Shadows to end the Dark Hour, they seem to hint at the idea that ending the Dark Hour uh, won't just end the Dark Hour. I'm not sure if the implication is that they knew this would happen and just embraced it at that point, or if they were trying to say something else, but that's always how I interpreted it. 
What this tells us though is that this was all more than just an accident. Oops, we accidentally caused the end of the world. No, it's more like this is what people wanted. Mankind is ultimately what brought the fall upon them. You were just the delivery boy. As for Nyx herself, she lives up to how much the game hypes her as a threat. Or rather, Nyx Avatar, who was your friend Ryoji. His job is to usher in Nyx, he's what the game calls the appraiser. So really, if you're getting your ass kicked by him, then that's just really telling of how much more threatening Nyx is. While each individual phase represented by each arcana isn't really all that challenging, the real challenge is taking all of them on in tandem, along with the longest and final phase, death. If you die, it's all the way back to square one. It's so extra, but so fitting from a narrative standpoint. You gotta be able to read your party and make good calls in tense situations to save your run. The lowest level I've beaten this boss at was level 75, on hard mode, and I barely survived with the skin of my teeth. Too bad that wasn't good enough. And just to rub salt into your wounds, you're told that perhaps if more people were like you, then maybe you could have actually stopped the fall. Yeah, thanks game. But right as you lose consciousness, you hear the cries of all your friends. As cliche and overdone as the power of friendship thing is, I think it's way more earned here. Only the social links you maxed out will call out to you here, so it feels more tailored toward you. The final confrontation still brings chills down my spine to this day. I don't care that they keep reusing this in the games after this, this is where I first experienced it, this is where they did it first, so this is where I feel it the most. As Tartarus finally dissipates, there are no words spoken, just the sound of bells ringing, and the relieved look of your friends' faces. The main and most obvious thing to take away from this game is that it's not about whether you live or die. It's about whether you're content with the way you lived. But there's a little more to it than just that. Throughout your life, you will inevitably make contact with people, and only through developing meaningful relationships can you leave a lasting impression. Sure, no one's gonna remember you a thousand years after you die, but who cares? The people whose lives you've touched will remember you for as long as they live, and that's all that matters. So whether you die tomorrow, or a year from now, or a hundred years from now, your life matters. A lot more than you think. You matter. 
a lot. Wait, what was the point of this video again? Oh yeah, Persona 3 is great. I love it. Oh yeah, I should probably bring it back to that fanbase split I brought up like two hours ago. Huh. For many people, this is where the Persona games went from good to great. For other people, this is where the series went downhill because friendship is corny and the series became anime. I don't want to play this anime crap. Anime is cringe. Bruh, I hate hearing that, dude. Not liking the game is one thing, saying the series only started falling down the traps of anime stereotypes at 3? That's just whack. They just use the word anime as an innocuous pejorative for edgy and or etchy stuff. Shin Megami Tensei has always taken inspiration from anime. Persona didn't become anime. Anime changed. Media in general at the time was changing. Persona games have always been reflective of the culture at the time, to a T. Persona evolves with the culture and media around it, and it will probably change again one day. In before Persona becomes an open world game and pisses off all the current fanbase. Persona before was like the anime back then. Persona 3 is what anime was like in the 2000s. Persona 5 is similar to anime now. I think maybe people just can't deal with the fact that media isn't going to pander to them forever. And when it doesn't pander to them, they'll start complaining about how it's pandering to the target demographic it's trying to go for. I've already come to terms with this though. There could very well be a day where I stop caring about Persona. But even if that day comes, I don't think I'll ever truly outgrow Persona 3. This game just resonates with me that much. We all have that one piece of media that we didn't know we needed and experienced just at the right time. For me, this game was just that. At the same time though, there are things about Persona that will probably never change about the series. Partially thanks to this game, namely the new staple mechanics and overall structure. Simultaneously, there are things that were always there and haven't changed. Maybe they never will. Like I said before, every game reflects the culture at the time the game was made. That is a constant that will probably never change. Jungian psychology will always have a hold on how the story is told, as well as how the games will handle its symbolisms and character archetypes. Social commentary is pretty much a given in these games too. Screw the people who say, this game did this archetype the best. They're dumb. They don't know what an archetype is. Screw the people who say this cast didn't feel like friends. They don't have friends. Screw the people who say this game is too dark or this game is too happy. They don't understand the subject matter and just passively consume it through the aesthetic. You know what? I I'm starting to question my own sanity right now. Maybe Persona 3 didn't change as much as I thought it did. Maybe Persona is just some goofy ass series about high schoolers who are a little too obsessed with Jungian psychology and fortune telling. But hey, it's carried them pretty far. And I guess that's all that really matters. <laughs> Hey, 